Okay, welcome everyone. As people are entering the room, we are ent We will be starting the last speaker series for this year. And I am happy to be handing this over for an introduction to uh, Shyam through, uh, from the Department of Biomedical Informatics. They have a strong program in uh, machine learning and computational biology. And I thought I would let Shyam do the introduction for John Califort. Shyam. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm indeed very pleased to introduce Dr. John Califort, who is the speaker for today. He's the CEO and founder of Asher Orion Group that is located in Pittsburgh. And this is a firm that is relatively new. It provides advice, services, and solutions for digital health and medical AI solutions. So John got a bachelor's of science in electrical engineering, as well as in physics from the University of Scranton. He followed that up at the University of Pittsburgh with a master's in electrical engineering and then a PhD in electrical and computer engineering with a bioengineering minor. He focused during his PhD work on personalized delivery of contrast material at uh, computed tomographic angiography. And as you can guess from that, that's the area of the focus of his research. After his uh, doctoral work, he was the director of informatics research and strategy at Medrad, which is a local company. Uh, which developed injector technology for CT and magnetic resonance imaging. He then briefly worked for Bayer Healthcare and then moved on to Chicago, where he was the chief scientist in digital and informatics research at General Electric Healthcare. He recently came back to Pittsburgh to found the Asher Orion Group. And so, as I said, his focus has been in radiology and he has identified and built a new medical imaging IT market segment in radiation, contrast media analytics and radiation dose tracking. And he has developed with academic healthcare systems, AI augmented diagnostic medical solutions. Uh, he has been granted 38 US patents, numerous publications and has given numerous invited lectures. And today he's going to be talking about perils, pitfalls, and solutions, crossing the translational chasm with machine learning algorithms for diagnostic medicine. And before I hand it off to him, um, please type your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of his talk. So on to John. Well, thank you very much, Sham, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, and everyone for the invitation and the uh, honor to speak to you. And um, <clears throat> great to be the last one for the year of 2021. As uh, um, you heard, part of what um, I've been doing this past year, I decided to leave the confines of corporate world of product development, management, applied uh, research and start my own uh, organization, uh, largely because of the activities for the last 10 years where I've gotten very involved in large scale informatics, especially informatics IT, and really regulated software as a medical device. <clears throat> so I've had product management leadership roles when I was part of GE Healthcare in imaging IT, PACS, radiology, cardiology. And then as we transitioned part of the strategy that we looked at in terms of, well, all this machine learning, quote unquote, AI uh, was becoming very, uh, very vogue, right? Especially when IBM Watson was, 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 was becoming in the press every day and ImageNet was, was breaking news. So as an organization, part of what <clears throat> we had strove to do was, well, let's not just focus on the technology, but let's... Uh, use the construct of open innovation, work very closely with academic and community and government agencies and organizations to develop, co-develop, co-create uh, solutions that are not just for publication or not just for, for research, but that you ultimately want to bring into the medical device uh, portfolio to, for global delivery. So being in that position and then my broader career of building medical devices and doing regulatory work and submission, I've, I've really have come across and seen different models that work in terms of this innovation mindset? What does it take in terms of taking a concept, an idea from a need 
all the way to to regulators and then out to the market. A uh, big part of my role, one of my roles to EDGE Healthcare, we're global solutions management. So throughout my talk to here, I'm going to address a lot of the needs and circumstances that uh, are, are present and needed um, to improve healthcare globally. You know, machine learning can be one element of it, but more broadly speaking, a uh, theme to mention is, is this notion of medical informatics and software engineering and computer science and diagnostic medical knowledge are all needed to come together. Because I think a, a lot of some of some of the less than optimal results that I had seen in, in my career um, were somewhat due to, to not having a good understanding of the, the big picture, of understanding the value or of too focusing in on technology. Uh, all you need are data and some pixels and train them and off we'll go and we'll replace radiologists and pathologists in 10 years, right? Um, so so uh, some of that context, again, for myself of going out on my own, having all that experience and knowledge, I feel like I can bring that to small companies, to providers, to, to government agencies. And so uh, that, that is really where my passion and focus has led to. And so that's also part of, uh, of what, what brings us here today. Um, obviously, you can read this. Some of this is those typical materials you'll see in, in uh, intro corporate level uh, discussions. But I did want to put a box here for a second because, again, this is the Institute for Precision Medicine. And I think from a vendor industry perspective, there is the precision medicine definition that I think many of you would recognize and acknowledge in terms of molecular uh, chemistry, molecular medicine, and cellular interactions. Uh, but then there's also this buzzword use of precision medicine uh, at the marketing level for medical device companies, IT companies, digital health companies. Um, in my perspective, being enmeshed, you know, I, again, I've worked in pharmaceutical companies, I've worked in, in medical in technologies uh, across, you know, even not just in the imaging world, but in, in clinical care, critical care. Um, that, that I, I think, a uh, an operative definition of precision medicine definitely has to include the genetic molecular component, definitely, right? But but the idea about though being able to better make a, a diagnosis or interpretation as soon as you can the first time, and then leading that to better treatment decisions and reducing that iteration, right? Uh, and that minimizing the trial and error, I think, is a key thing. The recognition is there's always going to be that trial and error. Right, medicine is is by no stretch uh, a solved discipline. I always chuckle a bit of these digital twin type of concepts. Like, we'll make a digital twin with enough data. I was like, well, we'd be living to be a thousand years old, right? If if it was just a matter of being able to model and understand um, <clears throat> data trends in, in patients, right? So there's always going to be that variability. There's always going to be unknowns. But this is where data driven innovation should help and and, and should have a play. Uh, as also, too, we all know globally the, the stresses on the healthcare systems, both from booming populations, reduction in, in uh, uh, funding. Uh, how is it that we can address these, these existential needs for the healthcare system for the betterment of the population, right? And arguably, one hypothesis is, well, how do we liberate and create value, right, from data. It's not just as, as Judy Pearl, right, the famous mathematician would say, data are profoundly dumb, right? But it, it's, it's what you want to do with those data. How do you apply them? What are those insights? And then most effectively bring to some decision and then cause change. Um, so I think as a community, again, a shared community, because it, it's, it's not just about radiologists or pathologists or computer science. It's, it's really a, a, you know, a team sport to recognize the value and, and, and bring these into the clinic or into the uh, you know, distributed health systems. Um, and especially when you start thinking about what is it that the human brain is not that good at, right? We're not good at intercepting and pulling together disparate streams of data. We're good at inferencing, right? We're good at experiential learning and, and knowledge and insight. Um, so part of what, when we get to the back end of this talk, right, I'll, I'll make the point that, well, this is where we should be focusing not just only our engineering efforts, uh, in terms of translating into, 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 into the market, into the product space, but also in terms of problems that we choose to work on, even as researchers and, and earlier on. I pulled this up, I think, for probably half this audience. This is nothing new, but um, I did I, I um, copy this somewhat from some of my friends at the American College of Radiology, the Data Science Institute, and we kind of put some of this together a few years ago when trying to explain to the broader uh, set of radiologists in particular, well, what is this AI? And, and I think everybody today is, is sort of 
sick of hearing the term. Um, I'm very much of the mindset of Michael I. Jordan, not Michael Jordan, basketball player, right? But the, the Berkeley, the electrical engineer, statistician, like we got to stop calling everything AI, right? Uh, and again, as, as, as a graduate student in the early 2000s, late 90s, you know, as an electrical engineering student, I, you know, I took three credit courses in a lot of these areas, right? I wouldn't consider myself back then because the word didn't exist, a data scientist, right? It was part of, you know, the discipline of electrical engineering, right? There was the same thing in biostatistics. And so this notion, I think, where we are moving towards today, we're in this in-between space spot of maybe we are evolving towards some new type of engineering discipline, right? It's, it's not necessarily electrical engineering. It's not really computer engineering. It's not applied statistics. Um, so, you know, similar to how chemical engineering and chemistry, electrical engineering evolved. Um, so, so as an operative definition, why I put this in quotes, is, well, there's all of this, <laughs> this theoretic underpinnings and framework. And now the issue is, well, how do we start applying these? Uh, and again, and for most of us that have been in this area, you know, these types of applications are nothing new. Uh, I used to go to the SPIE meetings back in the mid 2000s, and there was like 45 people there. Today, there's thousands, right? So, so a lot of this too is driven by the, the availability of compute and the availability of data sets and, you know, and, and the theoretical breakthroughs. Um, so I don't want to be a you know, complete curmudgeon. Uh, but again, the, the, I think that it's important for understanding uh, the landscape, especially as a more of a coming in from a clinical perspective or from a precision medicine. Well, there are multiple methods and part of the art of engineering is really understanding what are the most applicable methods to apply to solve a problem. How do you know what problem to solve? That is one of the biggest issues, I would say, and I contend that many, um, you know, medically technology-oriented uh, com uh, companies, vendors, startups uh, struggle with. And this, again, I think getting back to this theme of medical informatics and crossing that chasm, uh, how do you translate and understand the whole construct of thinking about medicine and health, translating that into something that you need to use and build solutions for? And you have to think about and understand, well, how is it that medicine is practiced as it is? I use this example here for um, those of you who are maybe not radiologists or not experienced you know, with radiology. I like to explain sometimes to more lay audience, well, what is a radiologist? Well, a radiologist is an expert pathophysiologist functional anatomist that understands physics and how to use physics to generate some view and visibility of the human body, right? Technically speaking, if you really want to get semantically deep, you know, radiologists typically don't truly make the full quote unquote diagnosis, right? They're interpreting, they're using their skill and knowledge of medicine and physiology to infer from photons and interactions and electrical magnetic waves to say, well, this is why we think is going on. Right. And then with the rest of the clinical information, then you arrive at a diagnosis. Right. Um, and there is the pattern recognition. There's an experience that's, that's learned from residency to fellowship of thousands and thousands of cases. But again, there's always this construct of understanding the context of there is physics generating these images. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I've seen and we see, I think, uh, frankly, I call them the first generation of AI applications that are being sold and used or tried in a lot of the clinical settings and diagnostic imaging is, is the realization that there is artifact. Right. How do you account for artifact, which is extremely nonlinear, very chaotic sometimes, you know, and many of the training sets and supervised machine learning are, are picked to be clear of data, uh, oh, sorry, of noise or error uh, in artifact. And then, then as soon as you get the first brain scan, uh, you know, looking for a, a hematoma and there's some dental streaking, the, the algorithm goes kaplut, right? Um, so, so again, that's, I think, having that context and understanding before we can build solutions that should augment and improve what human physicians or other care team members do, we need to understand, I think, what it is that the, that, that the humans do and how do we mimic or not mimic or enhance. And, and one of the limitations now, too, if you think about where we are and where we've been in terms of the narrow, you know, supervised learning, deep learning paradigm. And if you think again, if you step back to think about what is it that diagnostic radiology, pathology also does, it's, it's again, the application here on the, the x-axis is the different technologies, different ways of seeing and visualizing disease structures. And then you apply these across different organ systems and different disease structures. And then there's anatomical variations, there's anatomical needs. And so when you start looking at this matrix, you know, this interaction, well, there's gonna be findings that, that are developed that are different, that they you know, are specific for different disease states and parts of the body. And again, part of the medical interpretation and diagnostic process is to figure out, ah, 
well, this hyperintensity here probably means that this is happening. Uh, so therefore, you know, doctor ordered your test, you should, you know, do a biopsy, you should do something, right? Um, and now the challenge, like I said, though, with think about this from a narrow supervised learning perspective, just taking the idea of a, taking an MRI of the, of, of the knee for a, for a, a posterior CL, CL tear, well, you're going to have to find data sets that are not only representative of the knee, but that are going to be representative of the MRI technique, uh, maybe the field strength, maybe the gradient system, maybe the, the, you know, the contrast, the you know, T1, T2 weighted. Um, there are different defects, different artifacts, different, different views. So if you think about then from a purely supervised perspective, the need to get all of these example data sets and pull them together and annotate, you know, have, have humans drawing circles on stuff and passing through convolutional neural nets, you pretty, you pretty soon get to the untractable point of, okay, well, th this is not going to work for quote unquote replacing uh, what it is that, that, that the human physicians do. Um, you know, can you start filling in some of these? Yes. Right. And then th this gets though to this point of, well, what are these use cases? What findings, you know, what ones really could use some help? Um, and for what part of the world and for what pra practices that, you know, that you live in. Um, I think what I had definitely seen through, through doing, you know, some very deep kind of market research and, and, and investigation, uh, what, what you hear from um, radiologists in particular, the same thing from, from uh, uh, H&E, you know, for, from, from diagnostic pathology is, hey, okay, there is the stupid stuff we would love automated, right? Have the tools kind of help us, like why am I counting nuclei and cells, right? Or why am I counting lymph nodes, right, as a radiologist? Uh, how, why, why am I measuring things with little calipers, right? So, so there's a whole set of problems that the machine learning again, could be really good for that don't involve finding cancer. Right. And, and often that's hard to translate into investors or into to folks that are in technology that think, uh, well, there's just a scan that's done and, and from that, you know, you have cancer, <laughs> somebody needs that. So, so this context of understanding of what it is that diagnostic physicians do is critical from developing the concept to trying to sell it, to try to get it to market through regulators. The other theme that is pretty clear through most of the market research and discovery, especially the last five years, was, well, give us tools to help us in subtle cases, things that we're going to equivocate on or we're going to hedge. Um, that's where you think there should be, you know, there are, you know, I'll show an example of some work that I, I've been involved in. There should be some superhuman capabilities, right, of some of, of, some of the technologies, because definitely we see that in, in research papers and in lab. Um, but again, but you can't claim that superhuman ability for every indication and finding in that big matrix, right? Because otherwise, if you, you, know, you need you know, next three, 300 years to teach the convolution neural nets what to do. So, so th this gets into this, this understanding that we're, we're not just uh, trying to find, you know, where's Waldo, right, on, on an x-ray or a CT or an MRI. Uh, it, it's about understanding what is it you're trying to answer? What's that clinical question that you're trying to solve? Sometimes the ordering physicians themselves don't know what that is, right? They're, hey, help, I need help. Um, so, so how do we bring these tools together, the algorithms, the training, the right regimen, the right tools to make that possible, especially in a dynamic sense that this is, I think, too, some of the opportunities over the next decade is getting out of the, the fixed, if you will, you know, train your convolution neural net, you lock it in. Okay, well, hey, we're going to upload now some new training examples. Well, how do you really do that? Um, there's a whole bunch of regulatory engineering product questions and issues with that. But, you know, but, but where are there opportunities, though, that, that allow us to use um, not, you know, everything doesn't need to be deep learning, right? You know, how do we use and choose different techniques for adaptiveness, right? For reinforcement learning paradigms, you know, as a double E, right? This we used to call this model predictive control or receding control horizon problems, right? So, so th those, again, I think, especially as you look at a, even from a, you know, research perspective and grant development, you know, where, where should we be skating towards? Because the reality is like, yeah, like, like I say here, this is the, the, this, it's not, it's not realistic, right? As somebody that's been in the trenches, um, you know, quite literally in the trenches of scan rooms, cardio, you know, you know, cath labs, uh, CT suites, that there's too much variation. There's, there's, there's too much uncertainty that happens, right? Because um, especially administrators and business operation folks, 
um, like to, uh, rightfully so, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating there shouldn't be controls and metrics and analytics in, in healthcare operations. You know, that, that's definitely the case. But the thing is, you can't just, though, take blindly techniques from manufacturing and say, we're going to apply Six Sigma to the way that, that our surgical suites work. And it's always going to be the case, right? Because one of the things, and, and, and this, this also gets at, I think, some of the theoretic underpinnings of a lot of the, the techniques we use in machine learning and, and expanded is, is we want, we know that there is going to be appropriate variation. Removing variation completely is never going to be possible because you're dealing with sick people that manifest their diseases in so many different ways. Um, so the trick is for building this adaptive and smart system, how do you accommodate those appropriate variations, but help the care teams to make the right decisions? Like, you know, maybe don't bring the horse in here or something. Um, because then from a, you know, from a, the waste comment here is like, yes, there are lots of opportunities to apply, again, machine learning driven, data driven technologies, uh, you name it, right, to, to help address these, these issues around workflow, about disruptions. Uh, and this is too sometimes missed when, um, when you think about sometimes the, 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 the zeitgeist about AI, right, in medicine. Um, there are just as many good applications of optimization theory and numerical methods for solving scheduling allocation issues and problems. Um, and so in the diagnostic cockpit, if you will, right, if you think about radiologists to deal with, we have then this other challenge of, broken, sometimes information streams of convoluted systems that have built up over years. Um, and the, the reality is, so So I, I, I found this a couple of months ago, I was doing, doing a talk, and I, I dug this slide up from a 2012 about, hey, there's this issue of all these systems that don't really interoperate all that well, and information flows all over the place, right? And you can also tell, you know, Dr. House, there's probably some people it's called, I don't even know who he is. But you know, the, the, this, this idea, and the, this was put forward by Sandy Nepal in Stanford, again, back in the early 2010s. Hey, where we want to move towards, you know, is using, you know, what we used to call, you know, content-based image retrieval, you know, CAD techniques. How do we get away from just looking at pixels and drawing circles, but really trying to extract more insight from the imaging features, but also too from the uh, clinical information that you can get access to. And then the part about, because I've seen, I've seen big companies struggle with this whole idea, like, well, how do we, you know, we, we should be doing something in genomics. Uh, we, should, we, we should be doing gene there or we should be doing precision medicine. So we should buy a genetics company and put it next to our scanners, right? And like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense necessarily, unless you think about what is it you're trying to do. Um, and, and, and this is, I think, I'm still, I'm still very passionate about this area of quantitative imaging. Uh, this notion that you can extract more quantitative insight, things again, that you don't need to just put into a black box, right? Because biologically, you want to have some idea about, well, why do we think that this particular tumor is more malignant? All right, you can't just say, well, bruh, you know, 14,000 layers in the ResNet thought so, right? You want to be able to trace that back to something that could have some sort of physiological, biologic uh, resonance, right? So whether it's the texture because it's more bumpy, or there's a higher order feature of skew or kurtosis or a wavelet coefficient. And then once you start getting the quantitative aspect of this, but you need to be, you need to be able to really control the input and then how you acquire the data, how you process them, that, you know, if you can believe, you know, the reliability of those numbers, now you have some interesting possibilities, right, to compare these into some of your, your more classic or, you know, molecular um, uh, metrics and, and, and pieces of information. Uh, but to get to that vision of, of, true quantitative imaging that you can believe and trust. It takes the involvement of physicists. It takes the involvement of radiologists and pathologists. You really have to control your input. How do you actually approach and process signals? And how do you approach uh, for repeatability? Because again, the, the world is nonlinear, right? As engineers, you know, we, we essentially try to make a nonlinear world linear. Um, and there is a difference when you are designing an MRI system and this imaging processing channels, same thing for CT or ultrasound. There's a sort of a different approach you're taking when you're trying to zero in and, and make the image as good as possible. That's a slightly different design objective than if you're trying to acquire information out of an image space 
that you're going to use in some sort of quantitation or quantitative of, of, of piece. So, and, and, and this is, you know, this has been kicked around literature and, you know, some work I've been involved with at the GE Global Research Center. Can you work, for instance, in more of the, the raw, what we call critical raw data from MRI and CT, um, similar to what happens in, in lab medicine, right? Nobody, nobody spins a, a beaker around anymore and looks, you know, for the settling of, of red blood cells, right? That all kind of happens inside a box and numbers come out, right? Uh, but we're still very much, we're in the nascent phase, I think, in diagnostic imaging in that that era of like, well, we're kind of still spinning the, the blood cells. Um, but for us to advance into this next era, well, maybe we can again look at the original sensor data, right? What we call the sinograms and CT or case based data. Uh, but then the question is, how do you correlate that to something physiology based? So, very interesting, both theoretic challenges there, but then also clinical translation issues, which again, may not end up warranting much, right? But, but it's important to realize that. And then this other barrier, right? I put this little screen up here is just to give the insight. Uh, some of the reasons, right? We don't have that, that Dr. House you know, vision uh, is, is we deal in very large, complicated enterprise IT systems, right? The, uh, the backbone of, of most hospitals is the radiology packs and then the lab information systems, right? And these are dealing with tens of thousands of transactions, multi-users, concurrent issues. So it's, 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 it's not, and, and by the way, your radiology imaging management system, your PACs, that's a regulated software system, right? Um, so you can't just willy-nilly start doing updates and changing things, whereas a manufacturer, you just can't, you know, make some new software and push it out, right? It has to be done under a very mm, measured set of controls uh, to, to ensure safety. So. Um, that is that is a barrier, but also an opportunity to think about where where from the computer science evolution, computer engineering, and networking, and we're starting to see that transition occur today. Um, not fully, you know, I'd say healthcare operations. We're not truly fully into the cloud yet, but you really are starting to see though the embracing of of, of container technologies and Docker Compose and Kubernetes in production level systems, right? In terms of enterprises, even so, so we're 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 you know, we're on that cusp, right? So so it's 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 this need again, the needs to sort of help realize this future. It's this combination of technologies and engineering from you know, network, computer science breakthroughs, medical insights, informatics that need to kind of pull together to sort of change you know, the, the dynamic. Um, because this, this, this other mythology that uh, is grown and is still a bit out there, especially as it relates to um, a lot of the more say digital health uh, vendors or folks that come into, into medicine thinking, oh, we just need data. Um, <clears throat> and something that, that I like to, to point out, especially as, as I realize now, especially more in my independent consulting uh, world, I, you know, I have many clients that are trying to work in this data aggregation or this data curation world, you know, and again, me coming from the, the clinical you know, medical development side, I'm always like, well, well, hey, <laughs> we're not just pulling out, you know, image data, just anonymizing it, you know, because again, that's not going to be useful for most hard problems. But however, but, but if you think the bigger picture, well, yeah, there are a lot of data sets that are generated in, in medicine and healthcare that don't have necessarily that same level of protection or, or risk or, or privacy. Um, but I think the, the and the, I, I stole this from Medium from, uh, from Travis May, the guys at Datavant. Um, I was starting to make my own slide like this and I figured out oh, what the hell, I'll stop. Um, <clears throat> Because um, folks that don't have, I think, the clinical uh, informatic, clinical IT background, um, they tend to think of, you know, these data sets, right? And then this is what's been being transacted for a long time, right? From, from pharmacy information systems, from supply chain. The real challenge is, though, is when you get into, and you know, again, I think even from, you know, the data van thing, you know, that they talk about labs and EHR software. So there's this misperception, too, I think, in the technology a world that, oh, well, we're going to go talk to Epic or CERN because they, they, they control the data. So they can somehow give us access to the data and we're going to build, you know, just give us, you know, two years worth of, of your patient notes and we're going to run NLP on it and find a solution, right? And, and there's that realization they don't understand, like, well, no, no, Epic CERN is providing the technology, you know, those data assets, those things are within the institution. Um, you just don't come and get those. Um, but then there's this, I think this also, there's really, there's this misunderstanding of what happens, especially more, and again, areas that I've been deeply involved in, right? Making machine learning algorithms out of diagnostic images, right? Or out of waveforms or out of visible light images from, from slides. You, you know, you cannot just apply 
an aggregated view of the data set um, and, and, and work on it, right? You need access. The people training the AI models need to look at the actual data, right? And this is then one of these interesting challenges that now arise in terms of privacy, working together with other institutions. Uh, and I'll, I'll address some of the, the work too that have been doing in federated learning as, as one technology way of helping overcome some of these challenges. Uh, but there are a, a few different techniques, right, for privacy preserving machine learning development. But the issue I've seen with stuff like homomorphic encryption, differential privacy, is a lot of those technologies are coming out of area, areas where the data developer, scientist, engineer, uh, or the labeler don't actually need to see because I've, I've had I've had vendors come to me and say, "Well, why why would anybody want to look at the MRI images?" I'm like, "Because that's what we do, <laughs> right?" And and so so there are some specific challenges I think when you think about from a precision medicine diagnostic medicine perspective, the type of data sets we work with and the machine learning paradigms are very different from from other aspects of healthcare. Um, you know, there is definitely a need for having linked records, longitudinal. Uh, I'm working with a couple different oncology projects right now uh, in terms of how do we bring better insights to multidis multidisciplinary teams is what Europeans kind of call it, tumor boards. Uh, but there's this paradigm that still hasn't really completely taken off in, in, in the U.S. But this idea of that, hey, you know, you should have a more coordinated team making decisions and not just in cancer. Right. I think in academic medicine, this happens quite often, right? You have conferences for metabolic diseases and for neuromuscular, you know, skeletal. In, in general, medicine community practice, it doesn't happen as much. Um, but there is definitely a need there, a use case for helping to bring to those participants some insights that maybe the single radiologist who, who drew the last straw that had to prepare for the multidisciplinary team that, that week, you know, maybe didn't fully pull from that patient's record or the pathologist that has to describe with their hands in the conference, well, the cells look like this, right? And they can't actually look at the data. So, so, so there is this need for trying to mine, maybe find some signals in a record. That, again, humans not good at looking at that trace, but to do that, to build those machine learning algorithms, you can't just take a bunch of data and scrub all the PHI out of them, and especially your service dates, right? You can't just say, hey, I have a whole bunch of records for random patients. We don't know anything about their demographics, their age, their comorbidities, right? So, so more and more this need for building advanced, or I would say even, you know, somewhat useful machine learning, we have to think about, um, you know, longitudinal linking, you know, records. Um, this is also leads to, I think, some of the, so, so, you know, the theses here, well, why is it that a lot of these first, I call them first generation, you know, AI applications. I think if you look in, in the data, there are about 145, quote unquote, AI uh, algorithm products the FDA has cleared over the last three to four years, right? Um, and, so, and if you ask then, well, what's the market uptake of those? Mm, it's very different, right? Um, and so I contend part of the reason too why there is there there's some reticence or these solutions don't work. I mentioned one already, right? About the training paradigms, real realization, reality. Another one is just of people making some of these products don't have a good grounding in understanding what problems should we try to solve their technology, right? And this is where, again, you need a team of folks that understand what it is healthcare is supposed to be doing. What is the vocabulary? What's the language? Uh, I've worked in and around and in collaboration with at least four major medical device manufacturers. And I can count by me on one hand, the number of people in those organizations that know what a quality is or, or, or a dolly. Um, because again, it's, it's, just, it's just not part of that culture, right? Of building software or hardware devices where you need to think about, well, what is it? You know, what is, what, what is needs to be solved, right? You, oftentimes the, the answer is, well, the marketing guys will tell us what's important, we'll build it, right? So again, I contend, especially for a data-driven technology embracing, you need a much different thought. You need to have a team informed and thinking about the value problem. And again, globally, right? This is, this is data I pulled from the you know, VizHub um, visualization of global burden disease data. Um, and, and, you know, just as, as a quick look here, if you look at the, uh, the mortality data, um, yeah, cancer, still a huge problem, right? But 
but look at look at what's still killing so many people, right? Ischemic heart disease, stroke, um, you know, non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases. You know, so so where in here and globally speaking, where, where are there some areas, and especially look at the trends, what's happening over time and disability adjusted life years, I think gives you another more even more interesting kind of view in terms of building medical technologies. Um, because now you have a, you have an argument you can start making about, okay, look, we're we're, we're not just uh, trying to, to, to make something we think is going to reduce death, but hey, we're going to make some impact on the economics and, and, and help the health system, the broad health systems adapt and learn. And this gets back to understanding, I think, and mapping out and thinking through what are really the value chains, um, not to sound like an MBA for a second, but this is really important, I think, and is sometimes missed in the product management. And, and, and especially I see this in small companies and startups and big companies, but really getting in and understanding the whole value flow where, so in the case of radiology and imaging, it's like, okay, this all starts at somebody thinking that this patient could benefit from having some invisible either death rays or sound waves or something going through their body so we can help answer a question, right? And it ends with that information being turned into text, going back to that to that physician or a group of physicians. And all the stuff we do along the way, all the technology, all the fast Fourier transforms, all the convolution neural nets decision for all that is 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 really in that in that goal of trying to address that question and to you know increase that outcome and at the same time minimizing some of the cost to do that. Uh, and, and the solution set to solving these problems, especially again, if you think about these global issues, I pull this up here because again, a lot of work I've been, do, have been doing is, is and still is in, in stroke management to make an effective stroke program, which by the way, is, is a very good application for machine learning. And, and we're seeing that as well in terms of even some reimbursement patterns and, and the uptake of some solutions in the market. Um, but if you think about how is it that you really want to address the disability adjusted life years, mortality for stroke management, you have to think about, well, there's more than just the data that's acquired during that you know, diagnostic scan. There's that decision to call ambulance or in some parts of the world, they get wheeled in by their family members, right? And so each of these different capabilities need technology and also will benefit from, uh, from technology. But at the same time, I love this, this quote, um, I, because we often, and I've seen this throughout my career, is we'll, we'll often to try to over technological over technologize <laughs> maybe um, problems. I, I can I can tell you can't tell you how many companies I've seen in the last twenty years that have tried to we're going to replace the whiteboard right in the operating suite or in the reading room or somewhere. You know, at the end of the day, sometimes a marker and an eraser is just as good or as effective um, or better, right, than having to pay $50,000 to a vendor for software licenses, work with InfoSec, work with IT, your CIOs, do training, right? So, you know, again, again, it, and it's about adding up all of those steps and, and, and all those thoughts. Um, and again, these first generation algorithms we see coming into practice, whether they be in, in more medical applications as part of the EMR, but definitely uh, the things that we see. And, and again, I'm mean, using radiology as maybe a, uh, as a launching pad, because again, we have evidence that we have a lot of activity and deployment of these solutions. But the problems are not just about getting some pixels into your convolution neural net. It's about working across different patients. It's about now also rethinking the way we architect and, and deploy and bring out systems. So, so I would contend with this goal of if you want to build learning health systems, you really need to have infrastructure and technologies and semantics and, and data models and the whole, the whole shebang, right, to really make this work. Um, I use this as an ex example from where we've evolved in medical imaging from, hey, we used to have you know, tape drives with um, old, you know, CT x-ray data on it or, you know, big chunky hard drives, right? And today, you know, we have millions, if not billions of images in, in repositories, uh, petabytes of imaging data. But the issue is now is like, well, it's not so much about storing and persisting as, but how now, how do we grab and bring insight out of this? So, so, so make an intelligent integrated diagnostics foundation takes again more though than just a database architect. It takes understanding of the problems where should we make these interfaces? Where and how do we use the right type of, 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 of investments of automation and, and, and where should it, should it happen? Um, and again, I steal this a little bit from the agile sort of world, right? agile software management and development, you know, that, that an intentional 
architecture evolves out of careful thinking and actually doing, right? That you want to intend what it is you want to architect, but as you go and build and test, you're going to discover then what really happens and is needed. Um, and so at the bigger level, right? And again, I think in, in each of these little boxes and arrows, right? There are tons of <laughs> master's theses, PhDs, papers, activities to happen. Um, and again, it's, it's the application of data sciences, machine learning, uh, not just, again, sometimes we think it's, it's about trying to find uh, the, the tumor and say if it's cancerous or find the, the subtle fracture, right? No, there, there is needs for improving the decision-making process across the whole continuum of care. Um, but again, it's not just about that technology pro problem, right? It takes clinical insight, it takes leadership, uh, that takes then a need to get around some of these issues that, that, that are rightful issues in terms of data privacy and protections. Um, and then just too, some of the practical issues of if you're trying to build a um, especially, you know, use digital pathology, visible light imaging from H&E, you can have a pretty large data set. Um, so do you really want to be sending, you know, every time you want to train or even test somebody else's deep learning model on your H&E cohort? Do you want to be paying Amazon how many, you know, dollars per, per gigabyte or whatever it is? Um, so, so one of the solutions for helping address this is, is this technique of federated learning, which again has been around from the general IT uh, world, and you know some of the folks in Google and other you know, places have kind of pioneered this. But the whole idea is that for for diagnostic medicine in particular, we know we know the machine learning models to not un, to not overfit them, and also to to not make them less brittle. We want more examples. We want want more data, uh, but we also don't want to be necessarily necessarily trying to spend nine months bringing together a multi-site collaboration and contracts and IP. So federated learning is a technique to you know, try to bring the algorithms to the data sets. Um, using a you know, toy example here, really, to, to, to kind of give an example or to talk about, well, what is it that you know, federated learning can do and why would we do it? So assume we have three sites. They want to collaborate on, on this awesome problem of, you know, the connection between IQ and pet ownership. Um, but, you know, there's a prohibition on letting IQ values leave each university. Okay, well, well, how do we, how do we now work across these three, three sites? You know, we essentially want to do a linear regression, uh, but site one and site two can't put their data together so we can just run them all in one, you know, in, in, in one space. Um, <clears throat> so, the situation we got, you know, data sets in site one, we got site two. So, so the, the current, the most applicable paradigm for federated learning is okay, well, in site one, apply your, apply your, your algorithm, right? Um, granted the mean square error and, you know, the formulation for linear regression doesn't necessarily, doesn't lend itself for iterations. I, I get it. Again, it's just an idea. Um, I mean, to replace this with, you know, an LM approach or something where you can do line search. I don't know. But, but the idea is, is like, okay, site one is, is going to do the fitting of their data, right? Okay, well, now site two has a different set of data. Maybe they only they have fewer data points. They don't have the same number of data, right? Well, they do their fitting there. And then site three, okay, hey, different set of, of data. We do our analysis. And then now what federated learning is about is, well, instead of trying to pull all these data up to some cloud or central server, what you're doing is that each iteration, each training epoch, of your, your algorithm, you share up into the central place, the coefficients. So in this case for linear model, right? Simply the, you know, the A, the B coefficients. And then up here you do some then mathematical operation. Um, the state of the art, so to speak, is federated averaging, which, you know, kind of like most things, averaging tends to work. Um, but again, it, this is a very active area of, of needed development and innovation. Um, but so, so the coefficients are pooled, average, and then you send back to each site this now new global coefficient set, you know, AM, BM, and then you iterate again, right? Um, and so the, the, the theory being that when you're done iterating at each of these sites, you're gonna end up with a global model. Now, assuming your, your, your assumptions are proper, right? Or, or appropriate that the global model, there is a linear relationship in this case between IQ and PET, um, you know, the data are, 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 are not too collinear, right? So again, there are all those assumptions we tend to sometimes just 
gloss over in estimation theory. These become much more acute in federated learning, right? Um, which is again, a very active area of research and needed. But, but, but the idea though, is this is a way of getting you to get towards a more global model without having to share and push the data all over the place. Um, for more of a functional you know, perspective, right? This is this is this sort of idea that that the notion there's there is some central controller um, that is really controlling command and, and and heartbeat. In reality, for most convolution neural nets, right? What's it's not even the weights and coefficients that are, sh are shared. Sometimes the gradients are, are pushed back up. You know, then there's there there's reconciliation. Uh, yes, there are theoretical and practical potential privacy issues there. You can take from gradients, for instance, and do some manipulation and get back the data. Uh, but that's where well, hey, okay, fine, do some point-to-point -point encryption or do differential privacy of the coefficient transfers. Um, but again, that, that's also a good area of, of, ex, of, of research and needed. Um, coming to the end of the time here, but just putting this up to as, as a proof point that this stuff really can work in reality. This is work uh, that my colleagues at the Mass General Brigham, again, when I was associated with the clinical Center for Clin Clinical Data Science uh, during COVID, like everybody in the world, everybody was, hey, let's solve COVID problems. Um, but the opportunity that arose here was the, the, the guys at MGH developed a risk prediction score, uh, multimodal, right? So not just based on x-ray, CT, but also some clinical features. Uh, it was pretty decent, right? Right, both in the Brigham and also, also over at MGH, uh, but then other sites wanted to use it, right? So just informally, a site tried it in, in the UK. Oh, this thing sucks, right? So that was then, okay, the, the same realization we had doing some of this large-scale industrial academic work uh, at MGH. Hey, if we could, if we can federate these groups together, if we can do a means of not having to move data, do data sharing agreements with three different continents, four continents would be awesome. Um, and video was interested in this. So they funded 20 sites to come together to take this initial uh, MGH train model, deploy it at about 20 locations around the world and then retrain it. Uh, and so th this, and so this is this was recently published in, in Nature Medicine. A uh, number of my colleagues and, and friends, co-authors, um, and, and there are many federated learning imaging and radiology and even healthcare papers that are published that are mostly simulation papers. This is one of the biggest, most comprehensive one that actually is you know, based in, in real life and real data. Um, and it's, it, it's a very good read. Um, and this, this, so let me, uh, let me jump to this real quick. I promise I'll wrap up here. Um, uh, where, where this paradigm of distributed compute, because I, again, I'd like to talk about not just federated learning, but the notion is if you can do federated learning at scale, if you can do this privacy preserving work, it opens up a whole lot of new opportunities, uh, especially when you see some of the issues that, again, we know that is a problem in, in supervised machine learning and the overfitting and brittleness. Uh, and then this whole issue of like, well, hey, who's accountable for actually taking in this case, this is this is work that was um, done at Stanford, Michigan, using one of Epic's um, sepsis models and finding out, oh, hey, it took nine months of tweaking and re-optimizing when we deployed this into our setting. You know, there were some clinical medical issues. The sepsis scores are different. They're used, right? So, so the thought process here is if you can make a federated environment, you can start to address some of these issues, not only just when you're building the model, but also from a deployment and going to the real world model stuff. Um, I can give a whole other 45 minute lecture just on regulatory streams and issues and concerns. Um, but real quick, for the most part, of the AI algorithms you see in diagnostic medicine, they, they are automatically, in a sense, class two medical devices. So, so, the, so the regulatory pathway is somewhat clear, right? How do you do it? You know, there's some differences, um, but for the most part, I mentioned these 140 or so AI algorithms have been cleared. Most of them are predicated, their clinical performance, doing multi-reader, multi-center trials, reader studies, right? Um, but the algorithm then, then gets shipped and mailed, or not mailed, uh, that gets deployed, is, is that version of the model that went through that MRMC. Uh, if you want to now change it, if you want to update that convolution neural net, well, hey, there's some challenges, you know, catastrophic forgetting and what sort of enrichment do you do? Well, assume you figure that out. Well, now you got to go and somehow deploy this in each of your 1500 sites, or in the case of things associated with scanners, you know, thousands of places. Uh, the other issue is how do you even do surveillance? How do you know this machine learning algorithm is, is not working well? Um, how do you then isolate images or data points or waveforms at the facility 
that you should use in updating or retraining. Uh, without having those some sort of a federated distributed network, that becomes very challenging. Um, so arguably by having a federation, uh, by having privacy preserving ways of talking, communicating to reduce some of the contractual obligations, we should be able to do surveillance more easily. We should be able to do deployment updating uh, of even some of the, the classic you know, you know, CNNs and, and, uh, and other machine learning models. Um, and lastly, I think this, this speaks then to some of the real opportunities. Uh, again, a lot of lessons that I've learned from working very deeply in establishing contracts and doing co-creation work with, uh, with academic, you know, medical institutions, researchers. Uh, you know, we, we need to, you know, there's a cultural difference, right? There's usually that challenge of, okay, hey, look, I'm trying to discover new things, solve problems. I'm not so much concerned about what the FDA thinks or what engineering is gonna do. Um, but in my experience is, is that view needs to change a bit, right? Then on the industry side and innovator side, you though also have to try to understand like, well, what is it? What is the value really that your clinical colleagues, your, you know, your, your partner, your true partner is going to be, you know, we're, we're, we're in a different era now where you just don't write a check uh, to the, to the physics lab and say, go build us a surface coil and do some phantom work and cool. We'll take your MATLAB code and off we go, right? These are dynamic living, breathing algorithms. So we need to understand on the industry side, what is it that how do how do physicians think how do health systems work what are their challenges what should they bring to the partnership um, because again we need that joint approach to test deploy and, and enrich and bring to to life you know the, the, these innovations that potentially have have a lot of um, value because the, the, you know, this little box here is something that again has come up in a lot of the experiences I have it's like hey you guys, the product people, we're, we're academic researchers. Uh, we know some guys in the business development group somewhere said we're going to partner and share IP, but that's their problem. You know, I'm incentivized by publishing and getting tenure, right? Um, so so it, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's a very delicate area, but again, I think it gets back to understanding what it is that you can gain and glean from what you can only no, from living inside the health system, right? This is an example of some of this x-ray automation work been involved in. You know, you don't get this by having two product people go into two hospitals, right? You need people in the trenches. You need, you need, you need partners, collaborators. You also then need to have folks that understand what are some of the unique really data assets that you could use and should use to solve some problems. And I bring this up as, as my closing example, because this is an example again of work that I was you know, still involved in with, with colleagues up at Mass General, the Brigham, uh, on stroke detection. This algorithm here, what we did is not the most sophisticated neural net. It's, it's a fairly basic, you know, U net, maybe a Y net with some, you know, dependencies uh, pushed in. But what was really different here, medically speaking, is the Mass General Brigham has been doing diffusion weighted imaging. You know, so essentially they've been doing MRI on all their stroke patients for the last 10 years. Right. And if you know anything about MR physics and stroke, blah, 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 diffusion weighted imaging is essentially is the gold standard for finding out where there is dead tissue or dying tissue in the brain. So we were able to use that overlaid with CT information from the same patients to build a model to say, hey, algorithm, find in the non-contrast CT, which is a much simpler, much dirtier scan based on this, this information you get from the very, very ground truth on that patient, help us find where we think this actual core of the stroke is. Uh, and these results have been extremely uh, encouraging you know, and, and very powerful because the idea here from a health economic perspective is you can make a decision. You could see from a, a much less expensive technology, CT, non-contrast CT, you can get similar insight that you would get from a million dollar MR scanner, right? And so, so this is, again, this idea would not have happened without the involvement of neuroradiologists, neurologists, a custom data set and bring it together to also overlay it with the problem that needs to be solved globally. And that's not just a point problem. So um, that's, um, that's my story. Again, <laughs> could go on on a number of these other dimensions. Again, I, I didn't really go too deep into some of the theoretic and machine learning stuff. Again, happy to, to do some of those um, and some other prognostication on where I think um, you know, things should go, but very much appreciate your time. And I know how valuable everybody's time is. And, um, and thank you. So I guess, Adrian, back to you. Fantastic, John. That was great. That was a tour de force of, yeah, quite a diverse array of subjects. If you want to share, can you stop sharing your screen and then we can see everyone? That would be great. Um, we can either take questions in the chat, and there's already a few quotes saying, excellent, and thank you, John. Um, or you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. I will take the pleasure of taking the first question. 
I think a lot of people are somewhat frustrated by the lack of progress. And, and you kind of highlighted this at the start, it depends what the term progress is. And I wanna ask you about the Dr. House example. So you ended that and I was, I was wondering what you would say is the reason why we haven't made that much progress in that complex example of radiology uh, imaging. Mm -hmm. And I think your answer was, uh, it's quite complex and it's in a healthcare system and it's regulated, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too satisfied with that answer because we landed a man on the moon about 50 years ago. And I currently drive a car that's semi-automated. It can somewhat drive by itself, but it's not very good. And so I wonder, is it, is, is it, is that the reason or is it that the healthcare system hasn't seen value in this data and hasn't invested in systems that could do it? Because this mm -hmm. not being able to get the data is, a, is the impingement to machine learning and AI. Yeah, if you don't have the data, you can't do that. Yeah. Right. What is the barrier? Why, is, why haven't we made progress in that? Yeah, well, and, and it definitely is starting to change, right? I would say if even, so we were talking before the talk, before we started here about the RSNA, I think a lot of the uh, sketches and architectural renderings, even aspirations we had at UPMC and in, in the old technology development center, we are starting to see some of these realizations in, in the latest software offerings from, from both smaller vendors and bigger vendors. Yeah. Uh, and I think health systems are starting to embrace them. There's, there's an interesting socioeconomic piece here. So I think for about 10 years in the US, there was so much, you know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I mean, it's good. We have digitized health records, but there was so much emphasis in getting EMRs deployed, EHR systems in, deploying them that we are kind of coming out of that hangover, right? And so now CIOs, CMIOs in the last three, four years are now finally, ah, okay, what do we do with all these other systems, <laughs> right? And what's the value prop? But I still think there is though this, this underlying piece, which gets back to the academic medicine, the need for value. Well, for so many years, especially in diagnostic imaging, we got away with, hey, our thing spins faster and you get better isotropic resolution. But then the question is, well, does that matter? Right. Um, so so there is some of that as well. Right. Which, which which I think then gets back to the value proposition, the economics. Well, is it worth paying another three million dollars for this new improved you know, nuclear medicine, a hybrid, blah, 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 if like what we have is okay enough and how do we know the difference, right? Um, because in diagnostics, same as treating pathology, there's a whole health economic, uh, you know, literature base here. How do you demonstrate value of diagnostics? It's not easy, right? Because so many of their decisions are made downstream. You know, there are so many other chances for things to go wrong. So it's sometimes difficult to argue because I've been in these rooms, these boardrooms or helping my commercial colleagues. How do you argue to make an investment of large, large amount of money when it's like, well, hey, we're good, right? Yeah. Okay, we have a couple of questions. So Pradeep, you can ask yours. If you unmute yourself. Okay, we'll go to- Yeah, Shandong. thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, that was a difficulty to unmute. Um, Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kala, for this great uh, talk. I really enjoyed that quote from NASA you put in that's making me question a whole lot of things. <laughs> uh, so basically, go, uh, following up on uh, Dr. Lee's uh, comment, I wanted to uh, basically mention that um, a lot of these efforts are focused so narrowly that either they're not applicable in the actual translational side or the actual problems themselves are quite an open challenge even for academics, right? So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on uh, like, you know, which I think you kind of touched upon it in some sense, you know, which problems are really solvable or open which problems are actually translatable, et cetera, right? So right. I was gonna kind of answer Adrian with saying, we didn't make progress because we don't have solutions. You know, how, what do you think, you know? Yeah, uh, that's, so, so that's why I mentioned some of these operational, you know, uh, ideas. And so even so, 
back when I started getting involved in radiation dose tracking, dose management, it was a difficult sell to health systems. They'd be like, well, who cares, right? You know, then all of a sudden, oh crap, we're burning people's hairs off with CT scanners because we're not measuring anything, right? So, you know, so sometimes it takes an externality to make people, and I mentioned that because you could, that really is an operational problem, right? And so there are ways of addressing and doing machine learning and applying, you know, you don't even need to use machine learning, just use some good old basic you know, statistics. Um, and so, so sometimes those problems get get missed because it's easier, right, doing voice of customer to talk to the, 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 to the radiologist or surgeon like, well, well, yeah, I, I, you know, patients come in, I don't, I don't care, right? Somebody takes care of that. Um, so, so those, you know, some of those problems are definitely tractable and are needed. And this gets back to the whole value quotient. Um, there is a whole other, um, I think, discussions gets back to some of Adrian's questions. Some of these, these easier problems to solve for both pathologists, radiologists, oncologists, the challenge is you really need to be sometimes in the bowels of the, in, the information system that the physician is using. All right, it's much, and then this speaks the need for better interoperability. You know, whether it's it's uh, some of the work from Fire, and, and, you know, we used to have CCAL, right? That was a disaster, right? But but the the issue is, unless you're Epic, for instance, not not to pick on Epic, but if you're Epic or Cerner, it's a hell of a lot easier to bring these innovations into the desktop than it is if you're three guys in Canada that have a cool idea, right? Because doctors, like any knowledge worker, right? You know, you, you don't want to be picking up your cell phone while you're logged into an EMR, then open a web browser, right? So so there are some fundamental IT network interop challenges, I think, that do inhibit some of this, especially in healthcare. Um, that, that, again, is a whole, whole other discussion, but yeah. Fantastic. And so we have a question from Shandong Wu. Okay. Hi, John. Uh, nice to see you here. Yeah, this is a wonderful talk, a lot of insights. Uh, I also want to follow up the first question um, uh, Adrian was asking. I want to share one thought here. I think the value here is this. Uh, oh, Shandong, we lost you. you. Hear me now? Yeah. You hear me now? Okay, yeah. Think about a new treatment or a new medicine, right? So we, 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 we do clinical trial to show that there is a there is added value, there's a benefit on that, and then we take action on here. I think that the the key for AI to have value to really gain trust or gain uh, people to start use it or or even purchase it is that we need a prospective study clinical trial to show really the AI will make a difference. Will add add value to the patient care. Right now, there's a lot of hopes. But we have to really see the data to supporting that. And there's you know, single-centered data or mm -hmm. rich studies, which are not enough. There's a recent paper in, in, in science showing that a lot of study in the retrospective evaluation, when they are translated to real-world pers perspective evaluation for, mm -hmm. for cancer treatment, a lot of the solutions are not, not working from the AI generated solutions. It doesn't work. So we really need a perspective study to show that. And unfortunately, I think there are some ongoing prospective AI studies. I think in Europe, there are two studies on breast imaging, breast cancer studies. I think that's really the trials or study we're looking at and we wanna see mm -hmm. the results. And I can imagine if these kind of studies are published uh, you know, with the benefit of that, it will be a big effort. It will be a big motivation and data supporting us to start to really move, you know, move this forward and, 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 and translate to the clinical study, right? So that's my, my, my answer to that question. So I also have a question to John to you is you, you talked about a lot of, you know, today I think FDA already cleared, cleared more than 140 uh, software, AI software uh, 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 got cleared already. So in many of those areas or AI software you have seen based on your experience, which areas or which um, uh, uh, system or which, you know, organs, areas or modalities, where yeah. do you think there could be the first or the first views that could potentially show the value. Um, because we know some product, if, right. it, it, it will have values, but you think where, which area could it be that, that kind of uh, uh, a model or system that can show this potential? Sure, and, and yeah, I, I talked a bit, it's one reason I picked some of the stroke work is doing. So I think neuro mm -hmm. is really an area where again, and, and some of the reasons there is a, a, a reimbursement 
pathway for mm -hmm. automated what's called large vessel occlusion algorithms, right, where you can find the blockage because it ties directly to a clinical impact, right? How do you more quickly, without needing an expert radiologist at that point of care, to make a determination that this patient is a candidate for revascularization, right? So. It, you know, the algorithms to do some of that assessment aren't necessarily the most complicated, right? But it fits within this pathway that, ha, we could really cause some impact. Um, and it builds upon, again, the medical, the hard work from the RCTs, from the neuro, the interventional community, um, cardiovascular, you know, there's some good, good, good work and um, things out there in terms of being, you know, making more quantitative estimates. Um, there is, will, there is enough interest and good technology out there in breast that, I mean, there's still this hangover from the first generation of breast CAD where most uh, diagnostic radiologists are like, ah, but, but there are some really creative techniques that are being taken and new workflows. Um, then lastly, again, this whole area of quantitative imaging is, is you know, doing things in oncology for, for reducing the need of measuring things manually or right? having repeatability, um, which also ties into radiation therapy. So, so I, I think breast, neuro, heart, parts of oncology, radiation therapy, you know, we, we know that, that that's where quasi objectively too, I'm seeing most evidence that's being created and also interest in the marketplace. All right. Thank you very much. John. Thank you for that. Okay, John, we're just after five. So I think we will call it there. I think, thank you for giving the seminar. I think, thanks for taking the questions. I think everyone was trying to suck information from you as you're the, you know, the ball that's going to give us the answer to the, to the greatest area. So mm -hmm. thanks for doing that. We truly appreciate it. And everyone, you know, John is in town. And so if anyone needs um, help or support, I'm sure he's around. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, I said over here, my love in, So. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank All you guys. Right. Thank, Thank you very much, John. Thank you. It's yeah, a wonderful talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye.